Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Renato Gonsalves and I'm a platform expert for Out Systems. Today we're going to talk about system operations, the Java side, so we're going to talk, this is part two, and first thing we're going to do is actually recap what we talked about today on the last session. So what we talked about was the Out Systems platform architecture, so the platform, which services we have. We talked about the one-click publish, standalone versus farm environments, the out systems licensing, what's an activation code, serial numbers, what's IPP, and we got into the installation and configuration. So basically we went to versioning, we look at the checklist, and we get into deep with the configuration tool. So starting on that, and basically starting on the installation and the standalone versus farm, what we're going to talk about today is actually the farm installation. So the, the front, the, the single server installation is pretty straightforward. You just open the configuration tool, just follow all the links, and you're pretty, pretty much done. <coughs> when you start going into the farm installation, things get a little bit more complicated, and you need to meet, pay more attention to several points. First of all, what's a farm? So a farm is basically a group of machines that work together and form an environment. The, the thing you need to, to catch from here is that although you have several front ends, you only have one deployment controller. And you always start the configuration by doing the deployment controller because every single front end requires the controller in order for it to start. So after adding the controller, when you add a new front end to, to an existing farm, what happens is basically all the applications that you already have deployed are automatically deployed to the new server. So basically, as soon as you start the deployment service, everything is broadcast to the other one. But in the same thing happens. So it's the same install procedure as the, 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 the single server, although you just need to copy the server.hsconf, which is the configuration file that the configuration tool loads, which has all the configurations in. So what's actually different? from the from the, the single server uh, installation is that the controller address cannot be localhost or 127.0.0.1 for that matter. So basically you go into the configuration tool of your controller and you change it. You need, just need to, in, in, you don't skip the farm configuration, you get into that and you change the localhost to the IP address or the name of the controller address. One thing, the configuration tool needs to be exactly the same in all of the servers. So the name or the IP address you set up here on the deployment controller server needs to be recognized by all the front ends that you're going to add to it. Another thing is the front end IP address. So this, this will always show a list of all the IP addresses of your server, all the IPv4 addresses, by the way. Now the thing is, this IP address is not the public IP. This is the backend IP address. So this is the IP through where all the front ends will communicate with each other. So this setting here, the front end registration IP address, it's the only setting that's different between servers. Everything else is exactly the same. And you can always choose the one that you actually, the automatic will select the first one you catch. It can be this one. If it has more than one, it will be one of them. You don't know exactly what, which one it is going to have to be. If you want, if you, let's say, if you have uh, um, a farm that has two, two um, network connections, one for the external connections and one for the internal one, you would like to select there the IP address of the internal one so that the front ends communicate with each other through the internal loop. Okay. Okay. So the procedure is pretty much the same as a standalone. Just have in mind that controller IP address needs to be a DIP or the name of the server. In terms of licensing in front end, everything is exactly the same. You have just one license for the whole environment, and you just need to publish system components in the applications once, and then they're deployed to all the different machines. Okay, so in the configuration tool, again, deployment controller machine must be first. And the deployment controller cannot be localhost. And the reason why we keep saying this is because this happens every single time you do this for the first time. You always forget 
the local host. So please try not to. Again, after changing this to the IP address, the correct one for the controller, you copy the server.hsconf file. This file is saved as soon as you click apply on the configuration tool. So when you, when you finish all the scripting, the server is, will be updated with all correct controller address. You copy it to the front end servers, you paste it there, and you run the configuration tool. If you, want, if you didn't select automatic on the front end list, you need to go there and select the correct front end IP address. And that's the only change you're going to do. As soon as you click Apply, everything, the deployment service will contact the controller and will start deploying all the applications automatically. Load balancers. So the platform supports all the way to layer 7 load balancers. We support almost every, I believe almost in all of them, of the uh, balancing algorithms, round robin, list connections, you name it. And we support both sticky and non-sticky sessions. The reason for this is the session model is actually stored in the database. So it doesn't matter in which front end you're going to hit, you always have the information on all of the front ends. So you don't need the sticky part. You actually, I, we advise against it because this way you can have all the sessions with the, with the load really um, divided by all of them. And if one of them actually dies for some reason, the users won't actually catch any problems. They will continue their work normally. And we also support HTTP and HTTPS tunneling. Nowadays, the application server, and we are well able to automatically support compressed content for both static and dynamic. And we are also uh, supporting uh, the caching content with expiration uh, headers. But this is just from version 9.1 and on JBoss and Wildfly stacks only also from .NET, but this seems is for Java, so WebLogic doesn't support this yet. We actually cache the suffix for static content, so every time you publish, the suffix changes, so you, your users will get the new versions of the static content as soon as they're done. Application stays running, and the cache will be in place. Okay, so network requirements for publishing and runtime. So during runtime, you need, so during publish, First of all, you need the controller to communicate with the database. So you need the basic ports, 1521 and 3306, depending if you're using an Oracle or a MySQL server. The controller needs to communicate with the front end through the deployment service so the applications can be deployed. This is done through port 12001. Again, front end needs to communicate with the database to get data. Same ports for depending on if you're an Oracle or MySQL. The front end needs to communicate to the controller, so the other way around, to make sure that everything is OK through port 12000. This is the deployment controller. And then, despite we know that the ports they're going to use are 12001, 12000, but since we use uh, Java and we use the Java remoting object, we also need the RMI port open. So 2033 needs to be open between the servers as well. And we also communicate here, so the controller to the front end. If we're using a web logic, this is just for web logic, the 5556 for the node manager, and the 7001, 7002 for the admin server. In terms of runtime, the only thing you need to open to the outside is actually the 80 and 443 ports, so to HTTP and HTTPS access. In terms of monitoring, you can also, you need to monitor every time you go to the Service Center Environment Health page, you'll have the, all the checks if they're green or, or if they're red, depending on the services of the platform. This will do depending on the server you're in. So when you access one of the servers, remember, Service Center is a web application, so it will run on the server you're hitting. So if you have more than one, depending on where the load balancer is pointing, is where you're going to hit. And that front end will need to communicate to the controller, to the port 12,000, so for the controller service, uh, the 12,003 for the log server, 80 for the application server, 12,001 for the deployment, 12,002 for the scheduler. Oh, we have one repeated here, and this is on purpose because you need to communicate with the controller and with the front end. Now, most of the times, the controller server is also a front end. So he needs both of them. So he needs the controller part and the front end part. That's why we have the distinguish here. So 
If a controller is also a front end, you need the 12,000, 12,000 in tree for the log. But since it's a front end, you also need a 12,000 in tree again. You just need one of them because it's the same port, but you have the, deep, the scheduler and the deployment. Because depending on, this, on, the, on the server, you'll have different types of servers, services running. Okay, so in terms of connectivity, this is just a clarification. So JBoss, Wildfly, and WebLogic are normally configured to listen in port 8080 and 8443 instead of the default 80 and 443. The reason for this is just security limitation. Because uh, on a Linux servers, there's a restriction. So the first 1,024 ports are privileged to root users. And since we don't want uh, the application server to be run to be running as a, as a user with a, with privileged admin, uh, with privileged uh, access, what we do is okay. We set it up with a normal user. It runs on port 8080 and 8443. And then we have IP tables on, redirecting port 80 to port 8080 and port 443 to 8443. So for the outside users, they will access port 80 and 443. They don't even know what they're, what's happening below the, after that. But internally, we're redirecting all that traffic from 80 to 8080. This way, we'll have a WebLogic or JBoss running with a normal user, no elevated permissions, on 8080, and we're redirecting the traffic. Now, IP tables is enabled by default by the platform. If you don't want to use IP tables, you can disable it, but you need to find another way to redirect this traffic. Otherwise, the platform will not work on those default ports. OK, so we've talked about installation. We've talked a little bit about what's happening over there. Now let's talk a bit about upgrading. So upgrading the platform is basically changing the first two digits, so the major and minor version. The first thing you need is always backups. You need to backup stuff before you try to do anything. And then you need to go through the pre-requirements checklist and validate if everything's OK. If not, install whatever needs to be installed. Let's say, for example, if some new version will require a new uh, application server when we change JBoss. So we need to have that new software at least ready to be installed. And when that thing is done, we need to install the platform. We need to upgrade the metadata. This is done inside the configuration tool. One of those last steps will actually automatically upgrade the metadata. Install Service Center. Again, this is done in the configuration tool. You have a question to ask you to install Service Center. And then install System Components. System Components is actually a part of the platform. You always need to publish System Components. This is done in Service Center, but you always need to publish the latest System Components. Otherwise, we can't guarantee that everything will work properly. After that is done, you go ahead and upgrade all your applications. Since we're changing the major and minor, development tools are actually needed, required to be upgraded as well. So as soon as we change the first two digits, the development tools need to be need to be the same. So always the first two digits need to be the same between the platform server and the development tools. In terms of the application itself, the application upgrade, what you, you should do is always start with development and do an in-local component upgrade. So validate the breaking changes document. Upgrade first the extension models, because the space will actually require them. Then upgrade all the spaces. If you have breaking changes that you don't really know what's happening, ask assistance from your developers. Usually system operators don't. They, they know what the applications do. They don't know how they were done. And sometimes a little bit of change can actually change the flow of the application. So ask assistance from your developers to assist you in validating the breaking changes and fix them. In production, use a previously upgrade solution. This is extremely important because it's faster and safer. Applications usually require changes after an upgrade. And if you have a solution pre-done, you can actually, and if you also have more than one front end, the operations can mostly of the time be done with zero downtime and be done by operators. So you don't need a developer to be there in order to do the tasks. Although it's important to have one on standby, it doesn't really need to be there. There's ways to do this with zero downtime. You test everything, so you make sure that you have everything 
prepared before going to production. And this is upgrading. Now, on the other hand, upgrade that changes the first two digits. Patching changes the latest two. Now, a patch is just a light update. Usually, there's no breaking changes. They're just releases and revision changes, so basic fix. Development tools don't need to change. Sometimes you actually go ahead and change the, the latest two on the development environments before changing the platform. No problems there. You can actually have already the, the latest ones. Usually we advise you to have the latest ones, but still if you don't, there's no requirement to change the development environments. And there's no additional software requirements. Since there's no, no breaking changes, everything that you have in place will continue to work. As for steps, the same thing. So you install the platform server. You update the metadata install service center. This is basically run the configuration tool. Update system components once again. And after that, republish all your applications. It doesn't have breaking changes, but still, you should always apply this in staging environments first. So apply it in development. Go all the way to quality. Keep testing everything to make sure that you have everything prepared. Although we say there's no breaking changes, sometimes things happen, unfortunately, and we don't, we don't want you to have any issues with that. So prepare for everything. It's easy. You just stage everything, start in development, make sure that everything is okay. So you basically do a sprint with a, with a patch or with an upgrade. Okay, in terms of tuning of the platform, basically we can tune, in terms of front end, we can tune the platform, the application server, and of course the applications your developers can tune the code. In terms of the platform, the only real tuning possible is actually to enable or disable the debug mode in these spaces. Now, if you're running on production mode and the license is set to production, by the, this is off by default. Unless you go there yourself and change these spaces to be in on, it, 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 it's disabled. So you cannot debug in production. However, on the other environments, on development, you can either choose to debug or not each one of these spaces. On development, yes, you should have it enabled for your developers to be able to debug. On, let's say, pre-production, so the, the environment before production, you should actually have it off. The differences are not that greater. They're not different. They're not that much of a difference. But still, you should have pre-production as close to production as possible. So you should have it off to simulate what is in production. Advanced tuning is also possible at the connection string. So you can go into the configuration tool like you, we were showed in the first uh, session. And you can actually fine tune the configuration tool in the connection string, sorry. You can add the number of connections you want in pool, the, the timeout. You can add several different types of stuff. But what we advise if, if it's working, don't try to fix it. Just leave it as it is. Because most of the times, the fixes we're going to do can create more harm than good. In terms of the JBoss, so this is a normal JBoss. This is a normal web application. So you can tune a lot of things. But what we usually do is just tune the memory and leave at least 2 gigabytes of, of RAM server to the, to the operating system and all the stuff that's running there except the, 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 the JBoss and leave the rest for the JBoss to do. Now, there's one thing about the JBoss is actually he's a little bit, he's a little, he needs attention. And we always need to be up, up ahead and try to validate if everything is OK, because no two applications are the same. So the settings that work for one customer may not work for another one. So you'll have to take in consideration the time it takes for the GC logs to, to do, how often are they running? Sometimes you need to tweak the value of the memory. Instead of having just the total memory minus 2 gigabytes, you should have something a little bit more tweaky. can actually go lower than this, depending on how the GC is behaving, on how GBoss is behaving regarding everything. Still, have an eye on this. Prepare for on, on, on pre-production environments first, and then go with that. Because no two environments are never the same. OK, backups. The platform is actually quite simple to backup. So in terms of backing up, if you back up the OutSystems database, we can pretty much reconstruct everything to what it was before. Now, the RTO, so the time it takes for it to put 
back online again will be enormous because you need to roll back the database, recreate the servers, reconstruct all the configurations. It takes a little bit of time and then you need to republish everything. So it takes a little bit of time, but still it can be done with just the database. What we advise you to do is actually go ahead and, and, and back up also the configuration file. So for example, the configuration tool, so server hsconf file, the one that the configuration tool saves, it already has all the passwords there. Actually, the passwords are not on that file, are on the private.key one still. All those files need to be, if they're downloaded and if they're kept, you already have everything prepared to do. Again, any file system, so application server customizations, the one we just did, so the, the, the tuning of the JBoss in terms of memory and everything, you can back up those files. And if something happens, you already have the fine tune that you take so long to get. It's already there, so every customization that you do, back it up. If you're using virtualization, then just back up the full server. It can work like that, although it takes way more space. But still, everything's possible. And this covers all the operations that we can do in terms of the, the, the platform. Now let's go inside and watch a little bit on what happens below what we don't usually see. Okay, so let's talk, we'll talk about a little bit about one click, click publish again, but we're going to talk about the first publish and the two-stage deployment. We're also going to talk a little bit about lost time, communications and stuff. So how does it communicate, how does it work, where it's supposed to be. And we're going to talk about timers and all the asynchronous processing, uh, BPT, emails. And we're going to talk a little bit also about how the logging mechanism of the platform works. So the one-click publish is basically a very complicated uh, diagram, but let's, let's break it down. So when we publish something, let's say we're going to publish through Service Studio to Service Center, we're going to send an OML file. OML stands for Out Systems Markup Language. So we're going to send an OML file, which is basically an eSpace, to Service Center, and then Service Center will send the OML file to the deployment controller. Okay, why is this? Because Service Center is a web application. If you have a farm with several front ends, you only have one controller, and your Service Studio will always connect to the Service Center, so to the front ends. So it will connect, it sent to the front ends, the front ends will send to the deployment controller service, and then it will start compiling. So it will grab the XML file, which is the OML, which is basically a compressed XML. We'll grab the XML, do a first compilation, which is basically create a Java project and the Oracle scripts. We'll do a second stage compilation, which will create the jar that we're going to place inside the, the, the web application, the application server. Pack everything in a zip file, and it will send back to all the deployment services. So basically, at this point, so number three, we're going to broadcast the applications that we just pack to all the front ends we have. So if we have one, going to be broadcast to one. If we have 10 or 20, it will be broadcast at the same time to every single one of them. As soon as that point is done, we already have the folders in the in the, all of the front ends ready to be used. But the application server is not up to date, it's not pointing to them yet. So after that, we're going to update the database with the changes that we just compiled here. And we're going to ask the application server to point to the new application. So at this point we have the new application running. So recapping everything, so OML is just a single file that contains the application definition, so it's a compressed XML, if we're going to look at it at a more uh, lower level. And we're doing the deployment across all front ends in the farm without any manual intervention. So if you have one or if you have 20, it's exactly the same procedure. You just click one button and we'll take care of the rest for you. It's a unified deployment, so we basically take care of the application code and also the database script. So when you publish something, we're going to validate what's on the database at that moment and we're going to generate all the scripts that are required to update the database. And then all the external dependencies, this is basically all the, all the code that you did, so extensions and everything, are placed inside the applications directly without you having to take any consideration regarding it. And of course, the deployment is all actions are all logged for auditing purposes. They are all logged in the general log inside Service Center. So if you go to general log, you can see all the deployment actions. 
So once again, this is executed across all active front ends without any manual intervention. And the active word here is actually important because if you go to front end servers in Service Center and disable one of them, that front end server will not receive the new version you just published. Okay? However, as soon as you activate it again in the deployment service context, controller service, it will ask, okay, what do you have there for me to deploy? And it will start deploying everything. So eSpaces are deploying into the running folder inside platform server directory. So in all of the front ends, you usually have an OPT out systems platform running folder. And this is where all the applications will be placed. And then, upon startup of each deployment service, this is what I was just telling you about. When you, when you disable something, it's not going to be deployed. As soon as you start a deployment service, it will communicate to the controller, ask if it, if it has, it will let you know, it will tell him, okay, this is the last version I have, is it up to date? And the controller will say, is it yes or not, and here's the last version. So it will start deploying everything. This is also what we were said, what we mentioned when we said that when adding new front ends to a farm, you don't need to deploy anything else because as soon as you start the server, the deployment will ask the controller, okay, I'm here, give me every, every application that, that's there, and I will start applying everything. So this is pretty much that explanation. Okay, so once again, it's a parallel file distribution. What this means is actually we're going to broadcast the changed files, and only the modified files are going to be broadcast in parallel to all the front ends we have. So if you have 10 front ends, we're going to have 10 files leaving the controller, one for each, one for each front end that you have. Another improvement that we have in the platform since version 8 is actually we now compile a share library that has everything. So basically we have one folder in, in the platform folder that has all the jar files. And then we have pointers, so each application has a pointer to that jar file. This allows us to control what's there and allows us to control our disk space. Okay, so we talked about a one-click publish. Now we're going to talk about a two-stage deployment, which basically allows you to do all the heavy lifting beforehand and then just pause the deployment to, for you to have a window where you can actually deploy something in production which has less impact on the users and do that in a way, way shorter window um, on the second stage. So basically, we don't impact all the runtime applications that are running. This can be enabled in either lifetime, which is the left column, or service center, and is enabled or disabled per environment, which means that you can have it enabled on production and not on development, because on development you don't want to do two-step deployment, you just want to publish everything and test it right away. On production you probably want to start publishing on the beginning of the day and only in the end of the day when nobody's using the system or at least a subset of the people are using it, you can actually go ahead and change the applications. Okay, so how does it work? Okay, like the first approach we saw for the one-click publish, it's basically the same procedure. So we we're going to publish something to Service Center. In this case, we're going to use Lifetime. We're going to publish an OSP, which stands for Out System Solution Pack, which is a solution that Lifetime compiles with all the applications that you sent. He sends it to the front ends, to the Service Center of the destination uh, environment on Lifetime. It, the Service Center will send the OSP to the controller server. The controller server will grab all the spaces, and for each one of them, we'll actually compile the space. So do a first stage compilation again, create the Java project, do a second stage to create the jar, and pack everything. And it will do this for all of the spaces you have on this solution. When everything is done, it goes ahead and sends the zip file that you just packed to all the existing front ends. So it's just going to deploy everything. And when it's done, it just pauses, it stays there. So basically what happens is we're going to wait here until you tell me to do anything else. So at this point, you have on deployment, you have on all of the front ends, all the folders created in the right place, everything is in place. The, the, database, the database here scripts are ready to be run, but they're not run yet. 
and it just waits there. And when you when you feel that you can and it's a or it's a good time to to do, you can go ahead and do the second stage deployment. And the second stage will actually go ahead and update the database and change the application virtual directory. So uh, virtual directory is an IS term, but still it po changes the pointers of the deployment in in web in weblogic or actually JBoss. So it basically points to the new version of the application. And only those two operations are done in the second step. But this is where the risky part is. So you can actually abort an application between step one and step two. If step one goes wrong, you can abort, recreate the solution, start again. And on step two is just that part where you actually have problems. So it's the part when you update the database, the part when you change the application. So if something goes wrong in this part, in this part you can actually have problems in production. On the first step, no risk and no impact is, is added to the applications running. Okay, so how does the lifetime architecture work? So basically, first of all, lifetime is actually an out system system application, but it's a web application, runs on the front ends. Another interesting fact is that it only runs on one of the environments of your infrastructure. So if you have development quality, pre-production, and production, it will only run on one of them or a separate environment just for lifetime. And what it does is actually deploys application between front ends. So you can actually select an application to move from development to quality or from the quality to pre-production, from pre-production to production. So it allows you to do the staging part of the applications. And requires that all the versions, all the environments are in the same major and minor. So they have to be in the same version, independent of the revision and release, but they have to be on the same version. Okay, so if you have lifetime on production, you'll have something like this. So you will connect to lifetime, and lifetime needs to connect to development and needs to connect to test. This means that your developers need to connect to production, because that's where lifetime is, in order to create plans to move to test. Another problem here is that lifetime and oh, so sorry, and that test and production communicate with each other. So let's say for a reason that you want to back up the database from production, put it in test, so that you have the most recent data to test. If you forget something, this database has IP addresses and locations and web service pointing to production. Since the communication is possible, you can actually ruin production with if you forget something. So this is this can be a problem. So what we suggest is, okay, then let's have lifetime here on a separate environment so your development doesn't connect to test, test doesn't connect to development, test doesn't connect to production, production doesn't communicate with development. So you have isolates. You can actually create barriers, so firewalls in between the environment and one is totally isolated from the other. So for example, if you want to back up the database from production, put it in test. If you actually forget something, it doesn't ruin production. You just have an error saying, oh, I can't communicate with server X, Y. So you just go ahead, correct that, no harm is done. Another interesting fact is that developments, developers don't need to communicate to production. They don't even have to have access to production. They just need to access lifetime. And you want to move something from development to test, for example, you go to lifetime, you set it up. Lifetime will ask the development for that solution will grab it back and then it will send it forward to tests. So the person that's actually accessing lifetime doesn't need to access any of the other environments below. So this is actually creates a new barrier here for your own safety. So, but in order for lifetime to know what's in each of the environments or so it's to know what can be moved, it needs to synchronize. And the synchronization process is actually quite simple. So basically, the yeah, lifetime consistency is uh, of all the versions of your application. So every time you publish an application, it updates lifetime, saying, oh, I have a new version. Also, every day, lifetime do, do a full, um, does do a full uh, synchronization process to make sure that he has everything that you did on that environment. And we're talking about uh, synchronizing applications, for application versions and also users. The application version is just the number of the version of the 
set of models. We don't move anything to one place to another unless you say so, of course. And also very important here is Lifetime uses BPT, so it uses business process technology, which means if you don't set up the, environment, the front end where Lifetime is to run BPT, Lifetime doesn't work. So you need to have that setting on. By default there, it's on in all of the servers, but if you disable it, make sure you don't disable it in where Lifetime is running. Okay, so talking about the scheduler, let's get into deep and see a little bit more how, what the scheduler service is actually responsible for. So, scheduler service runs timers, BPTs, and emails. So pretty much all the asynchronous processing that the platform does. Scheduler service runs inside a front end, so you'll have a scheduler service running on every single front end you have. And the way this works is all the applications you have write to the database on the queue all the things they need to run. So let's say, for example, a timer. All the applications will run to a queue on the database saying, oh, I have this timer to run, and it's supposed to run at this point, and so on. So all of them will write there. This queue is ordered by uh, running date, so the schedule will then grab one of them, marks it as done, uh, as, as running, and will pass it on to a thread. Scheduler by default has three threads for timers, two for emails, and five for process. This means that a scheduler service alone, so a front end alone, can run three timers at the same time, send two emails, and process five processes. Okay, if you have more front ends, you'll have more of those. So you'll it's the three threads times the number of front ends you have. Still, the, the queue is done on the database so that all of the front ends can actually read from the same queue. Explaining this, let's put this a little bit to words to see if it makes a little bit more sense. So, the scheduler checks the timer to run on the database, evaluates the next run. So, basically, it will get the first timer that it's supposed to be at run. So, what it does is goes against the current date and fetches all of those that are supposed to run, where the next run is supposed to run in the past, so already overdue. So we'll grab the first one, we lock that timer, make sure that nobody else will, will touch it, and then we execute it with a web service, which means a timer is actually run inside the application server. It's a web request like all the others, but is done through the scheduler service, but still, it's a web request. So it's going to run, it's not a batch process file, it's actually going to run against the application server. When it's done, it marks the, the timer as done, and set up the next run, if it has a schedule, or it places it not having any schedule at all, it doesn't need to run. This is for timers. For process, it's pretty much the same process. So it goes and fetch the next run, locks the timer when it's trying to get it, and get when it gets it from the database and starts to run. As soon as it's done, it marks it as done, and move on to the next one. Emails, same thing, fetches the one that's supposed to run first, marks it as, uh, mark it as running, goes ahead and runs it, and sends the email. Now, the scheduler sends the email directly to the SMTP server. He has a retry mechanism to send the email. After, getting, after creating the body of it, but if it fails for more than 48 hours, an email is considered obsolete, so it's discarded. Any email that's, that was supposed to be sent more than 48 hours ago is not sent. At least, uh, I'm pretty sure that's how it was and still apply. I'm not sure, I need to Again, uh, one more thing that needs to be important here is the scheduler fetches everything from the database every five seconds. So every five seconds, all of the schedulers, depending, the five seconds is not all of them at the same time, but every single scheduler service will go to the database every five seconds and ask, okay, give me the timers that you have to run, the emails, and the processes that, that I can run. So if you have several front ends, they will go in one at a time depending on how long it took for them to, to start the service, and we'll get every five seconds the information that's on the server. In terms of logging, so the platform has a database for logging. 
which is pretty much we have all the tables are inside the platform uh, database, but we prefix it with OS log. So everything that starts with OS log is pretty much a log table. Now we have 10 tables for each type of log. So we'll have 10 tables for error, in the type is error, general, screen, web service, all of them will be 10 tables for each one of those types. And then we have two views mapped to the current week and the week before this, because we will have one table for each week of logs. Okay? And those views are the ones that Service Center will actually use to show you the logs that you can see on Service Center. Still, log servers will write them directly. The tables are from 0 to 9 and we always write them in sequences. So we start on stay on 0, go to 1, from 1 to 2, to, and so on until we get to 9. When you get to 9, it goes all the way back to 0. So the logs keep rotating in this cycle. Now the thing here, this is not random. So the logs rotate every week. So Friday at 11.45 p.m., 11.45 p.m., the log table changes. If it's on 1, changes to 2. If it's on 2, changes to 3, and so on. And the rotation algorithm is actually the number of weeks since January 2000, 2000 mod 10. This will let you know which week we're in, so in which table of the week we're in at this precise moment. This means that independent of the environment you're in, the table that should, the week table it's always the same, even development, quality, production. Even between customers, the, 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 the log table is always the same. In every week, the next table is used. So if we're on 1, as soon as we get Friday at 11.45, we're going to change to 2, and so on. And the views for each one are actually rotated as well. So if we're changing from table 1 to table 2, the current view will change from 1 to 2. And the last one in the previous week will change from 0 to 1. You get the point. Now, one thing is important here. The old tables are cleaned as soon as the retention period passes. So you can set up the retention period in configuration tool. There's a one, one setting there, if you remember, that uh, uh, asks you how many weeks you want to store of logs. This means by default, it's four, just for you to know. And this means that although we have 10 tables, only four of them will have data. Because as soon as we rotate, so we rotate from one to two, this means that table, uh, I think it's eight, will be cleaned as soon as we do this. Because we will only have four tables with data on the database. Let's put this into a schema. So we have the log database here. And we have the 10 tables, so table 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way till 9. What this means, then we have the views pointing to the current week. So if we're on table 1, the current week will point to 1, the previous will point to 0. As soon as we change the, the, the week, table, the view will point to table 2, and the previous will point to table 1. The service center will access those views that we have, and will show the logs only on those views. So if you want a week that's two weeks uh, uh, before the one we are in right now, Service Center cannot view those logs. Although they are still on the database, you can access, it, access them directly through, the, through SQL, or you can actually go ahead and create your own application and, and, and point it to those tables. All of those tables are available as system tables. Now, how this works in terms of logging is all of Service Center and the OutSystems applications and also the OutSystems services will actually write all the logs to a message queue. This message queue is local to each front end. So each front end will have its own message queuing system. And then log service, which is also running inside the front end or the controller, will go ahead, grab all the messages it can, and bulk log them directly to a table. This allows the logging mechanism of the platform to scale up to tens and hundreds of thousands of logs. Okay, now just recapping the rotation part because that's actually kind of tricky. What it means is let's imagine we're currently on today's Friday and we're currently on table one. So this should be all the way dark, uh, uh, black all the way to pointing to table one. 
So we'll have four logs, four, four weeks of logs stored. So we'll have table 1, table 0, table 9, and table 8. Those are four weeks. When we reach 11.45 p.m., what happens is, okay, we're going to change from table 1 to table 2. So the view points to table 2. We're currently using table 2. It doesn't have any values yet because the current week is just starting and we don't have anything yet. Still, this is our current week. The previous is table 1. But we will only have four tables. We will only have four weeks of logs. So we will use table 2, table 1, table 0, and table 9. As soon as this change happens from 1 to 2, table 8 is truncated. So basically, we delete everything that's on the table. We truncate everything so that it doesn't create transaction log. It's fast, and it doesn't impact anything else. Just let it be. So the logs will be lost, all the ones that are there. And we'll still have four weeks. One of the weeks is actually the current one. OK, hope this shared some light. OK, now if we understand everything regarding the platform, Let's talk a, lot, a, bit, a little bit about troubleshooting. And the troubleshoot is not actually not that hard if you just know where to look for stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit about basic troubleshoot techniques and advanced troubleshoot techniques. Most of our problems will actually fall into this category here. With basic troubleshooting techniques, we can pretty much find all of the errors we have. There are some of them that are actually more tricky, but those are not that common. OK, so on the basic troubleshoot, the first thing you need to do is actually get the error. So check the environment health, the, the service center logs, or service out system services logs, application services logs. One of them should have an error, depending on the symptoms you have. Just go with the flow, try to understand where the problem is. OK, so the environment health is something that looks like this. You'll have a column for each one of the services and a line for each one of the front ends you have. So you'll have the deployment controller. This is just a single server, so everything is on the same. But you have a column for deployment, a column for SMS, a scheduler, log, deployment in IS. By the way, sorry about this. This is a print screen from an IS version of the platform. On the Java stack, this column doesn't exist. So there's no SMS connector. OK, so what it means is when you have the green, it means that everything is OK. The, 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 the service was able to be uh, reached, and everything was well configured. When you have a red cross, it means something is wrong. You can actually have a question, uh, an exclamation point as well. When you over over the, with the mouse over the, the error, so if it's a cross or depending, it will show you a detailed part of what's inside. Or if you click the detail, it will actually show you what's happening. So that's a pretty way to start if something happens, for example, in the services. If not, you can always go to the service cent to go to the service center logs, and you will see something like this. It has a lot of information, sometimes too much. It's overwhelming. But still, if you know where to look, you can pretty much go anywhere. So let's see. You can always see when the error occurred, this space where it was generated, the tenant, which is pretty much the, the user provider of the space. You have the user that caught the error, the session ID he was using, the server he was running at. So if you have several servers, this is very helpful for you to know if an error occurs only on one server or in several of them. You have the message, which is pretty much what happens. And then you have the error stack. And at the bottom of the error stack, you always have you, have the, you can actually see the private memories and the virtual memories of the server. In case of Java, you'll just see the memory. You have the URL. This is actually a Java stack, so it also has that. So you can see the request URL of the browser that the user was actually accessing, which page it was accessing. You can see the eSpace version that's published. This is the module version, not the application one. And you can see which version it was compiled with. Inside, you can always see the eSpace, so in this case, Service Center. It's an action, and the name of the action, you can see where the error is. In this case, in this particular case here, the problem is that the controller service cannot be reached. So basically, the server is down. The service is, is down. Okay, But you have a lot of information here. And most of the time, this information inside is enough for you to start looking at the problem and try to see if you can fix it. So if the OutSystems log files, they, 
if 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 the platform ones don't don't are not enough, you can always go inside to the, the service. So so the services logs, which are included normally in OPT OutSystems platform logs, and inside you'll have a log with a name for each one of the services. So you'll have one that says con deployment controller, one that says deployment, one scheduler, one log, one log, and so on. The logs rotate every day. So you'll have the one file that doesn't have a date, and that's the current one. And then as soon as it rotates, it will add a suffix. So at the end of the file, it will add the date where from that file was, was, start, was get. Also, these files include OS traces, if they're enabled. And by default, they're not, because this generates too much information. In order to configure them, you can go to ETC, out systems, and then you'll have a file for each one of the services, which is OS dot, and then you have the name of the service, dot service dot properties. Inside of this, you'll have a configuration that is an XML file. In the log for JLogger, you can set up if you want the fatal errors logged, the error, the warning, the info, or the debug. By, you, by default, it's on fatal or error, but you can go ahead and add more if you want. Usually, this happens when you contact support and you need some assistance and you need some extra information. We ask you to enable OS Trace. On the day-to-day -day basis, we actually tell you to leave this as fatal or error at the most, because this will actually create text files too big. In terms of the application server, for in this case for JBoss file file, they are usually found in the JBoss home, a standalone log. So for example, it's going to be OPT wildfly, in this case it's A21, final standalone log. The general log is in the same folder, but it's a server.log and contains all the application in all systems platform. This is the application server for the platform. So every runtime application error that you have, in this case server, it will be written on this file. And then you have the access logs to tell you to let you know which access and when, and the general logs that rotate every day again with the suffix. So for example, if for the server log, the current one will be server.log. The ones that are already backed up are server.log, and then you have the date. In this case, this is from 2015, December 25. OK, so again, the configuration files, we have the log files, and then we have the configuration files. They are also kept in the standalone. In this case, it's the bin folder. So we'll have the OPT wildfly standalone bin. So the application server will have a file called standalone-outsystems.conf, which is the configuration for the outsystems application server. And then we'll have another one for the message queuings, which is the standalone outsystems MQ for message queuing conf, which stands for the configuration for the message queuing. We, nowadays, we separate both of them. OK, so working the error on a, on a log, basically, the, 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 the guide is always the same. So if as soon as you discover what the problem is, try to see, first of all, see the platform. Sometimes, it, most of the times, we try to recommend a, an actually fix for it. So it says, try this or something like that. You can actually try that. If not, validate the cause and everything. And if not, search for information, search for information on the knowledge base. But Please consider certified internet, internet uh, knowledge bases. So OutSystems community, it's a great way to start. We have the knowledge base inside OutSystems where we try to put all the common, all the common um, issues that we find and how we fix it. We always try to keep you up to date and to, so that you don't have any roadblocks. Another thing is when you search those, those uh, knowledge bases, please try to validate if the scenario matches yours. Although the error might be the same, the scenario of the user that had the problem might not be the same as yours. If you apply his fix, you can actually actually broke even more your system. So try to evaluate if everything is OK. As soon as you have the cause and you have everything, then execute the recovery action, and you're good to go. By the way, one thing is very important. If everything else fails, so if you don't know exactly where to move, Contact out system support. We're here to help you, and we're always here to help you. As for the advanced troubleshooting techniques when the problem gets really tricky, 
we have a lot of ways to do it. We can actually performance monitor. We can we can check the network tools for IP config, ping, net start, telnet. By the way, ping is one of the most important troubleshooting techniques exists. You can understand a lot of problems just by using ping or the telnet to validate if ports are okay and so on. Don't don't be don't be scared to go to go simple and to to do the basic steps. And if the problem is in between and you lost some package and something's happened, we can always use sniffers, YAT, Wireshark, and so on to understand what's happening, who's cutting what part of the message in whatever happens. So if the problem kept gets real big, you can use all the tools out there that can troubleshoot the problems and go in deep. Don't be stuck. Don't try to understand everything. If you're if you're seeing that you're going to be stuck, contact us. Contact support. Go to the community. Ask the forums. People will help you for sure. Okay. So again, work the error. So search the internet information knowledge base. Search whatever the description you have there. So confirm that the scenario matches your problem. This is important. And evaluate whatever it applies to say that because if it says oh just format everything, delete everything, and start from sketch. Please don't do that at the first try. And always, always consider certified internet knowledge bases first. Sometimes you always find only a solution that's not on a certified knowledge base. Still, it's a good solution. But start with the, with the ones that you know are OK. And in order to avoid most of the problems, one thing you should do is actually proactive monitoring everything. So monitoring can actually help you prevent problems. And if it doesn't prevent you, at least you know them before your users complain. So this will leave you one step ahead and will leave your users happy. So a simple way to monitoring everything is actually check the performance monitor, of course, to see if the services are OK, if JBoss is running, everything. Server logs, see if you find anything new, anything suspicious, go ahead and tackle that. Lifetime performance analytics, so if some performance problems are starting to occur, lifetime will show you the degradation, deg degradation of it. Nowadays, lifetime will show you the time it takes on the server, on the network, and even on the customer. So you'll know if the applications of the problem is actually occurring on the network, if you have a switch that gone bad, something like that. Also, we now have uh, something on the Forge called Infrastructure Monitor, which also works on Java. It monitors the systems. It monitors if everything is running. So it will help you maintain the applications and the servers running as smooth as possible. And if you need a more in-deep approach, you can also constantly check the reports available on Service Center. You can check the system logs. So go into the front ends, each one of them, check for every problems you have there, and see what's going on. OK, I hope all of this was good for you. and. We'll be back in five minutes. And in the meantime, you can place your answers in the chat log.